go. Okay. <laughs> so thank you, Sasha, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, however, it is not actually true. Uh, so some of you may be surprised to see the word affection up here because that's not usually what I talk about at JFLS. Um, I've been doing this for a couple of years now, and uh, I've been doing a series on gender roles and sexual behavior in ancient Rome. Uh, this usually happens in February because the JFLS co-chairs like to do something that's kind of sexy uh, during uh, uh, close to Valentine's Day. This year, in their wisdom, they uh, decided to pick something that's a little bit too nice and warm and fuzzy for me to talk about what I usually talk about, heart work. Well, that sounds kind of nice. Um, it is, however, an opportunity to talk about what I actually spend most of my academic time thinking about, which is not sexuality, but sociality. Uh, which is a le uh, not, as, as, not as commonly understood a concept, and I'll introduce it in a few slides. Um, but uh, what I really study is masculine social behavior in a context of social intimacy. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about what that exactly means. But in order to talk about these subjects in the ancient context, uh, we do need to uh, uh, lay a bit of groundwork it's a bit of background. Uh, some of you will be familiar with this stuff from hearing me uh, give these lectures before. Uh, but for those who have not, uh, so a binary conception of, sexual, uh, of sexuality or sexual identity uh, is not an ancient construct. It's a, a relatively modern one, uh, much more modern than people think. Uh, there is a completely different set of uh, cultural constraints and social controls over sexual behavior in ancient Greece and Rome. Uh, particularly sex roles uh, being enacted as an extension of gendered social constructs, and I'll get into that in a moment. But the first piece of groundwork, the first piece of background we need to get our heads around is that the notion of a sexual identity that is founded on the gender of the person that you have sex with is not an idea that ever occurred to the Greeks or Romans. So they have no vocabulary to talk about concepts like gay and straight. This has led some, uh, sometimes some uh, commentators and observers to imagine uh, uh, the ancient societies as, um, uh, as, a very, as a very sexually free society, uh, which is both is and is not true in many ways. There are a lot of very uh, uh, extreme social controls over sexual behavior. Uh, they're just founded in completely different ways uh, than what we expect. So I'm going to illustrate this, uh, these two concepts, both the, uh, uh, the sort of non-binarism of their sexual identities and the gendered social controls over social behavior, uh, sexual behavior with a couple of examples. So beginning, this is two poems uh, by Catullus, uh, most, probably the most famous poet of the late Roman Republic. And if you look at these, there's a translation below, which you'll have a moment to read. Uh, if you read these two poems, kiss me a thousand times, then a hundred, another thousand, a second hundred, if I could kiss you 300,000 times without stopping, these are very similar, obviously. Uh, and even, even if you uh, don't have an understanding of the Latin language, you can look at things like basia mille and milia basium and be quite clear that there's, uh, the same language is being enacted here. So it might surprise then uh, if I were to explain that the poem on the left is written to a woman, the poem on the right is written to a man, by the same poet around the same time. Uh, so what's really interesting about this is that the exact same vocabulary, terminology, modes of expression are being used to write erotic poetry uh, to a woman and to a young man. Uh, that just sort of flags up the interchangeability of male and female directed uh, sexuality and, uh, and erotic desire. But if these two things can be both very freely expressed, uh, uh, poetry of this period uh, is written both to be published and to be distributed in written form, but very often to be performed uh, publicly in front of small social gatherings. So these concepts can be very freely, freely expressed, almost interchangeably, but as I said, Social controls on uh, uh, sexual behavior are very much a thing. They're just founded in different ways. And the next slide, some of you have seen this before, uh, but for those who have not, uh, I'll give you a moment to read this. Uh, so when we read a poem like this as a modern audience, we're inclined to read it. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, some people got to the end. That's great. <laughs> it's very funny. You can literally translate this into English 2,000 years later, and it's still funny. <laughs> We're inclined to read it as if this is a homophobic statement, because the way the poem proceeds, his, uh, uh, as long as his desire is, directed to, uh, is understood to be directed towards a female subject, it's okay. When it becomes revealed to be directed towards a male subject, it becomes not okay. It becomes something that's, uh, uh, that's culpable or that's worthy of ridicule. But, as I said, erotic desire for a man, uh, for a male or a female, almost interchangeable. Both can be freely expressed. So what's actually happening here uh, is not a look into uh, a, a sexual division based on the gender of the individual, but based on the role that the actor is perceived to be taking. So for the first three lines of the poem, it, is, it remains possible or even likely that Labienus is going to be the active role in a sexual encounter. He is going to be the dominant partner, the one who penetrates. And then at the end, uh, what's called the apros docaton, the, uh, uh, the way you slip a joke in at the end of one of these poems, it becomes evident uh, that he is actually going to be the passive partner. So that's the basic division, is that there are gendered social roles, there are masculine social behaviors and feminine social, beha social behaviors, and if you're a man, masculine roles are good and feminine roles are bad. They're, they're socially degrading, they impair your social status. So, this leads us into uh, the real topic, the thing that I actually think about. It's this term homosociality, uh, not uh, one that you hear very often. Homosociality describes the structures that govern social behavior and social relationships between members of the same sex. Uh, so uh, we can talk about homosocial spaces and the behaviors within those spaces uh, fall within the purview of this field of study. Uh, this college at its foundation in 1963 was a male homosocial space because only men uh, could come into these rooms. Uh, next door, St. Hilda's was a female homosocial space uh, because only women were allowed in those rooms. So the way that people uh, uh, interact and the, the structures that govern their behavior within homosocial spheres is the, uh, the object of this field of inquiry. This is, a, it, it's a mature field. Uh, the, the landmark text in the humanities was Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick's Between Men, uh, a very important book that came out in 1986. A more recent distinction that drives a lot of my own research uh, is this distinction between vertical and horizontal structures. So within a homosocial sphere, and I should uh, uh, sort of begin by qualifying uh, the, the work that I do on poetry, the production and distribution of literature in the ancient world is essentially a male homosocial sphere because uh, um, uh, elite literacy was almost exclusively re reserved for men. The social settings, the parties in which poetry would have been performed socially were also uh, exclusively male spaces. So the production and the distribution, the performance of literature is for me uh, uh, an act of homosocial performance. So that's really what drives uh, what I'm uh, looking into. This distinction between vertical and horizontal structures, what we most often think of when we think of masculine social behavior are vertical structures. Uh, gendered hierarchies, competition for dominance, the alpha male phenomenon. Uh, and that's a, that's a more mature uh, area of uh, inquiry in gender studies. Um, a more recent distinction wants to separate from that what are called horizontal homosocialities. So, uncompetitive structures, the expressions of genuine, uncomplicated, mutual affection and intimacy. Uh, love, essentially. Uh, the, the, the bromance concept falls very neatly within that, and I've actually managed to use that word in a couple of papers to my, my, own, gra my own great amusement. <laughs> so, this is a, uh, this is, these are concepts that emerge in, in modernity. I attempt to translate them back to antiquity, and so we can think, what does Catullan homosociality actually look like? This is, I should pause and, and point out that uh, I often read very vulgar and very obscene uh, texts, and my practice as a philologist is always to translate honestly. If there is a vulgar and obscene term in the origin language, I will render an equally vulgar and obscene term in the target language. So I'm not being deliberately prurient, I'm being, uh, being honest here. Uh, when I use these, uh, uh, the terms that you see here in the translation on the right. You've probably had a chance to read through this text here. Uh, it's obviously a very explicit 
uh, poem. This is a, a quite notorious uh, a, a piece of ancient literature. But we have to unpack it a little bit. We have to uh, uh, sort of expand the social context. So if you think back to uh, the first two poems that I showed you, one to a woman, one to a man, there was a, a, a repeating theme there uh, about kissing, thousands of kisses. And you saw that in both poems. So what appears to have happened here is that the poet Catullus performed or published uh, one or more of the poems I was showing you earlier to uh, other uh, members of his social circle, Aurelius and Furius. These are identifiable figures from the ancient world. We can position them in the historical context. Heard or read those poems and accused Catullus of being effeminate, of being, uh, a behaving, behaving in a socially feminine way and therefore degrading his masculine status. Now, if we think of this in vertical terms, in terms of those horizontal structures, expressions of dominance and co uh, competition, uh, you can visualize this uh, it, it initially. You think, well, Catullus was here. And this accusation of effeminacy degraded him in the natural masculine hierarchies uh, uh, of his uh, social setting. And so the people who made the accusation go up, and he goes down in, uh, in these competitive hierarchies. And so what Catullus had to do in order to regain his masculine social status was to reverse that process. So the publication and performance of this poem uh, reverses that imbalance uh, in the power dynamics between them by uh, uh, performing a threat, which essentially enacts the threat to violently rape his friends. He reversed that, uh, uh, that shift in their power dynamics, degraded them, re-elevated himself, re-establishing uh, his own position in uh, the hierarchy. So this is a classic expression of vertical homosociality. They're competing for top spot in their social sphere and enforcing a gendered hierarchy within it. But at the same time, a very different mode is possible. And now we're getting into the stuff that I'm really interested in and what I regard as being my contribution to scholarship on these subjects. So here's another poem, much less notorious, much less widely read, but to me, equally striking. It also needs a bit of elaboration. The, the, the context needs to be unpacked a little bit. So uh, Varanius, another historically identifiable figure, uh, had been away for several years from Rome on imperial service in Spain. What seems to have happened, or what we extrapolate from the text of this poem, is that Catullus heard that his friend had come home, and he imagines, fantasizes, really, the nature of their reunion, which, uh, which is imminent. And you really have to picture what he's describing. Hanging on your neck, I will kiss your lips and your eyes. This is an intensely physical expression of affection and intimacy. The embrace is at least as passionate as those love poems that I showed you earlier, but theirs is not a sexual relationship. There is no erotic component to the relationship between Catullus and Varenius. So this is pure horizontal intimacy, an intensely physical gesture of pure platonic affection between two men. This is also written to be circulated and to be publicly performed. So the same author who responds to a charge of effeminacy by threatening to violently rape one of his friends, two of his friends, can publicly display, perform, and circulate this act without apparently exposing himself to any charge of effeminacy. We think that through, and the gendered social context becomes extremely peculiar to, uh, to our external eyes. That Wanting to kiss your girlfriend exposes you to charges of effeminacy, such that you need to radically reassert masculine dominance. But this does not feminize him. This is not dangerous, where kissing his girlfriend is. So, as I said, poetic production and distribution is a performance of their masculinity. So, the question becomes, with these, this display that I've just been talking about, what's actually being enacted? The writing and the performance and the publication of these poems takes place in a unique moment in the history of the Roman Republic. This is uh, approaching the last years before the fall of the Republic and the rise of the Roman Empire. So the structures that sustained Roman society for several centuries were crumbling at, that, at this point. Alliances are shifting rapidly uh, in social spheres. The people who you were, you were your friends yesterday could become your enemies tomorrow, as poor Julius Caesar found out. 
uh, stabby, stabby Caesar right there. <laughs> uh, people were losing their wealth, their homes, and even their lives on a regular basis. And uh, this, this is important, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that talking about conclusions in a moment. But situating both of those acts, the violent reassertion of masculine dominance and the performance of intense uh, uh, non-competitive intimacy, both uh, fit within this context and need to be explained within it. But these two dimensions of homosociality, they coexist necessarily uh, in one individual. Catullus can engage in these alpha male vertical structures, uh, depicted here on the left by the pancratistes, uh, uh, the wrestlers, and also display uncompetitive affection and, uh, and intense intimacy, like uh, represented by the Dioscuri on the right there. Uh, I unfortunately couldn't find, I cannot find any uh, genuine ancient artwork that depicts uh, gestures as intensely physical as the ones described in Catullus's poem. Uh, that are not erotic in nature, uh, which just uh, emphasizes how striking the images in that poem actually are. So my theory that I, I won't go into too heavily because I don't want to get into uh, um, uh, too specialist a discourse, is that these two competing impulses, the competitive and the intimate, uh, the impulse to dominate other men and to achieve intense affection with them, both respond to the context that I was just talking about. So, when your friends today could kill you tomorrow, the drive to achieve an un uh, unassailable supremacy over your peers in a hierarchy becomes uh, a primal one. It becomes uh, 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 an issue of survival. But also when friendships and allegiances are highly unstable, the drive to achieve a permanent, lasting love and trust and affection between men is equally strong and equally necessary. Uh, so I, what I suggest is that these two equally desirable priorities, being incompatible with one another and being enacted simultaneously, precisely encapsulates the social and political context uh, of the late Roman Republic. So if uh, time is available, which I think it is, maybe just a minute, one last uh, example. Slippage is possible between these two concepts. So. Again, yeah, give you a moment to read this. I was very, I, I actually like published this translation of my MA thesis. I was glad that I managed to translate uh, using the word fuckboys. <laughs> one, one, of, one, of one of my great achievements uh, as a scholar, I think. <laughs> so this poem really brings together uh, some of the structures that I've been talking about. Uh, you can recognize these names, Furious and Aurelius. Those are the same two men who he threatened to rape just about, what, about eight minutes ago, I think. Uh, Eight lines are omitted here, as, as I said there, so this is a, it's a much longer poem. I defend it on one slide. It goes on and on and on about all of the things that these two men would endure with him and dare to do with him. He talks about uh, traveling around the peripheries of the Roman Empire uh, to the very dangerous places, Scythia, Parthia, uh, where Roman soldiers get slaughtered on a regular basis around this time. So uh, they're extraordinarily extraordinary lengths depicted that these two friends are willing to do for Catullus as a result of the genuine trust, affection, loyalty that exists between them. Instead of, instead of those things, he sends them to break up with his girlfriend. This is the same woman that he wrote the Kiss poems to, which produced his impulse to violently threaten the same two men who are depicted here. Um, uh, and he tells them to go and break up with her in very cruel and very vulgar and very public fashion. So his vertically homosocial opponents in these hierarchies are now his horizontally homosocial allies. The trust and affection that they have for each other is used as a tool to degrade and abuse the disloyalty of his lover, who is the initial source of their violent conflict. So uh, all I can say is that in the case of heart work uh, for Roman men, it's kind of complicated. <laughs> uh, and now I will close with my traditional JFLS closing slide, which is thanks for listening, and here's a penis wind chime. <laughs>